Welcome to the club. With a question mark. I guess we're all members of clubs, of groups. I am a member of a group. I guess most of the people in this room think they're a member of a group called Limburgians. I'm sure most of you think they're also a member of a group called Dutch or Nederlanders. I think some of you also think they are a member of a group called Europeans. And maybe some of you think we're a member of a group called World Citizens. The guy you're seeing here now is Gaucho Marx, a famous comedian from the 30s of the last century. And he once said, I don't want to be a member of a group that accepts me as a member. And that cuts deep to the core of what I'm trying to say tonight. Uh, it, it's a joke, but it's a joke with a hidden meaning. And that's what my subject is all about. Because if you belong to a group, and you really believe in that group, this often means that you're distancing yourself from other groups. And you do this unconsciously most of the time by ignoring the similarities between me and you or exaggerating the differences between me and you. This is called othering. And othering, I can assure you, is a dangerous sport. I want to give you three examples of othering, the technique of othering in a Limburgian context. And the first one is, you all know him, Frans Timmermans. He's from Halen, so he's uh, part of our group, uh, you could say. <laughs> um, and uh, he was, um, he was the, the, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs until this summer. Uh, then he went to Brussels to become uh, the Vice President of the European Commission. In the summer of 2014, he probably was the most famous uh, uh, Dutch politician we ever had because he had this very emotional speech at the United Nations about the MH17 crash. And because of this speech, and because of his promotion to Brussels, Dutch national television decided to do a portrait about France, de Jong uit Heerle. And um, this portrait was uh, telling, telling to me, and uh, maybe you saw it, but there was one central question asked at the end of the program, when a political analyst was asked, um, wouldn't Frans Timmermans be uh, the perfect prime minister for the Netherlands when he returns to Netherlands? And the answer was no. And the reasons were, were because he's from Limburg and because he's a Catholic. I repeat, because he's from Limburg and because he's a Catholic. The twin evils of the Deep South. Uh, this is a perfect example of uh, othering, and uh, the most uh, fascinating thing was that it, this wasn't even questioned. Uh, this was uh, accepted as a fact. Uh, this is another politician from uh, the Netherlands. You all know him. Geert Wilders from Venlo. And in 2011, his Freedom Party won the elections uh, in the Netherlands, especially in, uh, in Limburg, where they became the biggest political force. Almost two out of three Limburgians that went to the voting booth voted for him. And I remember that a lady friend of mine who works at a university in Amsterdam, she's a language professor, she was born in Halen, but she went to Amsterdam uh, maybe three decades ago. She told me that on the day Geert Wilders' Freedom Party became the biggest party in, the, in Limburg. Colleagues from the university came up to her and said, I quote, what's wrong with you people in Limburg? So I, re <laughs> I repeat, what's wrong with you people in Limburg? This is, this is really crazy because suddenly, in one second, she was uttered. She was not anymore a member of the community of the Amsterdam University. No, she was a Limburgian. And she was placed in a position that she had to defend or explain what happened here. This is a crazy example of othering, but it's, it's something that happens every day. And there's a an, an third example I, I want to show, show you, and that's uh, othering within a tribe. Now, let's call Limburgians a tribe. And you think uh, they're all the same, no, they're not. And maybe you know this theory, but people from the north 
of uh, Limburg often say that people from the south of Limburg are lazy and untrustworthy, uh, while people from the north are very honest and hardworking. And this cockamamie story uh, is uh, uh, proven by a, a sort of blood and boden theory that also the Nazis used, uh, by saying that people from the north had to work very hard because they lived on poor soil, poor sandy soil. So, so they were a hard-working people and they were honest uh, by effect. While the people from the south that lived on very rich grounds, uh, with trees growing and apples falling so, uh, like the rain, they, they became lazy and liar. I'm from Ruhlmann, so I'm halfway liar and halfway... Uh, but um, what, I, what I want to tell you is that this is also uh, an example of othering uh, within a tribe. I'll come back to Limburg uh, later on. Um, this is part of the cover of, of a book that came out uh, last year, Moral Tribes. Um, sometimes uh, in your life you read a book and you think, how, how was this possible? Um, this scientist is proving to me something I always knew or thought instinctively. I didn't do the math, but now it's proven by, uh, by science. Uh, Moral Tribes was written by Joshua Green, who is a psychology uh, professor from uh, Harvard. And he did, I think, a wonderful thing. In his book, he compares the human brain to a digital camera. Um, the average digital, digital camera has two basic settings, the automatic and the manual. The automatic is the most used, I think, uh, because you don't have to think. The camera thinks for you. The only thing you have to do is look and push on the button, and the work is done. In the manual setting, you see here, you have to think, and you have to have knowledge. You have to have knowledge of shutter times, you have to have knowledge of the effects of light. In other words, you have to think. In other words, the automatic setting is kind of a dummy setting, and uh, the manual setting is kind of an expert setting. This is important for what I'm trying to say uh, later on. The automatic setting, this is what Green is saying, is part of us, part of us all. We are born with it. It's wired into our system. And that is uh, very explainable, because uh, in uh, the, the first days of mankind, uh, being or belonging to your own group was very, very important. Your family, your children, your father and mother, the family of your father and mother, the whole tribe was one big entity. And your duty within that entity was to take care of the tribe. So most of the things you did was to be a benefit to the tribe. Uh, this is a very uh, logical explanation for the automatic setting. It was a kind of survival technique. But nowadays, this automatic uh, setting always, uh, most of the times, always leads to uh, distancing uh, yourself from other groups, like it used to be in the old days when it was useful, but now it also happens. So it's us, most of the time, against them, or against them, or against them, or against them. And I could go on for a day or two. Uh, let me take you back to the 2011 elections. These were all about identity. The two slogans you see here in Dutch are two slogans that were used by uh, the, the party of uh, Geert Wilders when he had this uh, major uh, victory, uh, especially in this province. And you can see what uh, he's doing here. It's a very basic, simple form of othering. Carnival and sweet and sour meat, that's us. That's our tradition, that's our culture, and masks and halal is them. So this is a basic example of uh, othering. I'll come back to the meat later on, because uh, that's a very uh, interesting aspect. Um, the incredible rise of popular politics, not only in uh, the Netherlands, but especially in Limburg, was something that uh, the newspaper I work for, the Dagblad de Limburg and Limburg's Dagblad, thought uh, worthy of investigation. So a colleague of mine, uh, Paul van Gagelonk, and I were assigned to do a year-long investigation on what was happening in Limburg. I won't go into all the details of the investigation, but some of the things uh, that we discovered I want to repeat here. 
the project was called at Lombard, the years of discontent. Uh, we were searching for the truth behind this discontent. What was wrong? What was happening? What were people here thinking? Now, what they were not thinking, at least most of them were not thinking that they were uh, afraid of Muslims or other religions or skin colors, but they were afraid. They were afraid of globalization. Uh, they were afraid of losing out. They were afraid of not keeping up with the tempo of modernization. And they, they were very, very afraid of being left behind. Being left behind by elites, by people like you and me. That's also outrageous. But this is the example. Being left behind. And being left behind means you're afraid and you're searching for simple truths. Um, this fear also leads to distrust. Distrust of local government, but also distrust of national government. This, in a, in a lot of ways, uh, explains also the elections. And the fear also extends to bigger organizations, uh, bigger banks, and especially uh, the European community. The whole idea of Europe was suddenly an enemy. And there were no people, at least I know, that said, yes, I'm a European first and a Limburger second. What do people do when they are afraid? Many of them will grab the past and say, say things were better when I was young. People cared for each other, which is true to a certain extent. This is a part of a picture of the center of Marsnail. This was a village I was born uh, 58 years ago. And I went back there. Uh, approximately two years ago, ago because they had a town hall meeting and this was very interesting. The town hall meeting was about what is happening now in the Netherlands and in the whole of Europe. This little village was losing its social fabric. There were not enough kids to play in the football team, there were not enough kids and elders to play in the brass band. Suddenly all things that were logical for decades were beginning to decay. And the locals were arguing in this town hall meeting from what is happening and what can we do about it. I was there as a member of the Masnil diaspora. So um, one of the questions asked at the end of the evening was uh, uh, hinted, uh, pointed at me. And uh, the MC of the evening said, uh, Johan, do you have any idea what we can do to bring life back into the society. Because one of the, the culprits in this whole story that was told by the locals every, uh, every second almost, was that the import, as they called it, meaning people not from the village, not from Roermond, not speaking dialect, but from other parts of the country, the so-called Hollanders, they were not doing their job in Maasnil. They were not partaking in the social fabric. So what can we do, Johan, to bring them back and help us uh, get alive again? I said, I don't have the solution, but I have an advice for you. Uh, maybe the next time you do a, a, a town hall meeting, you should consider using uh, the national language, Dutch, and not the local dialect, because the people you're trying to reach do not speak this language and do not understand it. So you're othering. And this is not because these were bad people. No, they had their mind in their automatic setting. If they would have switched to manual, they would have understood that you can't do an evening like that, speaking a local dialect that is not understood by anyone above the Venlo line. So that's an example uh, of, uh, of uh, othering in an almost innocent way. I told you I would come back to the dish. And there he is. Sourfleisch, sweet and sour meat. Um, this is considered something to be uh, of a, a Limburgian classic, a classical age-old dish, uh, true Limburgian culture. Now, essentially, uh, this dish was made of, uh, of horse meat, uh, but horse eating is now a taboo, so we switched to cows. Cows will be taboo in a few years too, but okay. You can eat uh, uh, sweet and sour meat made of cow, um, and uh, the, the, the specialty of the dish, as you know, probably is that um, the meat is tenderized in uh, an acidic, acidic fluid, 
uh, mostly a combination of wine and, uh, and vinegar for maybe two or three days. And then you cook it very, very slowly, adding sugar, uh, gingerbread, uh, or molasses, or strobe, as they call it here, shroop. And, and then you get a, a sweet and sour dish that is uh, uh, it's very nice it, uh, for people who don't know it. Uh, you can compare it a little bit with uh, Chinese tomato soup, the spicy kind. Okay, that is <laughs> sweet and sour meat. Okay. Uh, I did a story on uh, sweet and sour meat, surveys, uh, a few years ago. And when I did my homework, switching from the automatic uh, setting to the manual setting, so forcing myself to think a little longer than it takes to take a picture, taking the switch, I discovered that uh, uh, Zuurvleis was not exclusively a uh, uh, Limburgian uh, product. No. Sauerbraten is the, the German uh, variety, almost the same dish. Uh, Vlaamse stoverij is also uh, exactly the same dish. Uh, uh, Carbonade Flamande is another variety, and Vilvoorte uh, just to name a few of them. But if you dig really deep, you can find uh, dishes like this deep into France. So, before you think that something is a tradition, it helps to switch from automatic to manual and do your homework. And if you do your homework really good, and, I, and I, I'm not saying that I'm presenting here an earth-shattering uh, uh, discovery, but it can help also you in your jobs and in your hobbies to distinguish between myth and reality. Okay, I dug deeper, and I came by this, uh, out by this book, The Libro di Coquina. It's uh, the oldest surviving cookbook in Europe, 13th, 14th century, and this book contains uh, many recipes that are even much, much older. And two recipes I want to name here. That is Romania and Lomonia. Both are dishes using meat and using lemon in the Lomonia variety to uh, make the acid fluid, to make the, the, the meat soft. This is what the vinegar does in our zoo of lice. It's here done by using lemons. And the Romania uh, uses uh, uh, little uh, red, what, uh, what are they called? No, not pineapple, but an, another, another uh, fruit to do exactly uh, the same. And if you dig even a little bit deeper, you find the original names. Romania and uh, Limonia. And when you dig a little bit further, you find an age-old Arabian cooking technique called asik bai. Sik meaning acid or vinegar, and bai is eating. Asik bai, eating sour. And asik bai is, an, uh, is almost forgotten now in Arabia, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the time of the Moors, when they uh, invaded uh, uh, Spain, this uh, technique was properly brought over to uh, the rest of Europe. And don't you think that this is beautiful irony that uh, our traditional Limburgian Zuurvleis is uh, originally uh, from Arabia? <laughs> I can't get enough of that. <laughs> and you can also see it in the language. Asikbai, you can, uh, the, the German Essig for, for uh, uh, vinegar, an asset, the English, for uh, the description of a, a sour. This is really beautiful. You can e even see the Arabian originals in the languages from our neighbors. So, is there a lesson uh, to be learned from all this? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, in my job as an investigative reporter, I have learned to postpone judgment. Do not accept the story everybody tells you, try to check it, especially if you are othered or somebody tells you that you should be proud of something that is called your culture, I think you should uh, switch from, if you could switch from uh, automatic to manual and say to yourself, let's do the math. And if you do that, 
you could become a member of a club. I'm a member of that club, and I want to meet you there. I can assure you that it's a very nice club with good music and beautiful food. Thank you. <laughs>